We're in Kaitaia, the far north, to talk tamoko with Ani Kato. Ani is one of New Zealand's most celebrated female tamoko artists, who's had a long struggle to become recognised in what is traditionally a male-only art form. So Ani, can you tell us what defines tamoko and historically what does it mean to the artist? Um, for me, um, the definition of tamoko is, you know, it's whakapapa, it's genealogy. Um, in terms of the receiving end, um, it can represent um, it can represent uh, someone's personal achievements. Um, it may represent, um, you know, acknowledging someone's passing. You know, so if you know if a grandmother had passed, you know, maybe the mokopuna, the grandchildren will receive it. Um, but it's kind of like a direct um, connection to you know, to your ancestors who wore it. Uh, so it's kind of bringing, reviving it, bringing it back to who you are. It defines who you are as a person. Historically, what it means for me, you know, that's my relationship to my tupuna, to my ancestors. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm privileged to be able to pass that on to someone else. Yeah, and for them to wear that for the rest of their life. So how did you discover tamoko and when was it that you decided that that's what you wanted to do? Uh, the first time I saw moko was at a, a tamoko wānanga in Paparore, just up the road. And I think I might have been eight or ten years old and there was a whole lot of gunny artists that had kind of just gathered together for this wānanga. And it was kind of like for, for us up here in the north, the coming out of, of moko, uh, the, the revival of moko. So when I saw it, you know, I was naturally intrigued and um, my uncle was getting his puhoro done and so my auntie was stretching and I remember my mum saying, okay, time to go home. And I would always be like, oh, can I stay longer? Um, so that was the first time I saw it. Um, and then, I, you know, when I went to school, I was the kid that just scribbled all in my books, um, at, you know, getting close to leaving school. It was always um, a desire of mine to become a moko artist, but it's, you know, there's that stigma of it's, it's a male art form. Yeah, so when I left school was when I decided that's what I wanted to do. How I went about it was another story. So how has being a female artist uh, been perceived in the past for tamoko artists? In the past, I'd say looking 20, 30 years back, it wasn't, um, you know, it was just a male-dominated art form. I, I don't know any woman that did it. Um, yeah, so it kind of, you know, changed my thoughts about, you know, wanting to go into it as, you know, not legal, um, but is it is it right for a woman to be doing this kind of work? You know, am I going to come through and, and, you know, hit a lot of bumps and people saying I shouldn't be doing it? Um, so then it was kind of, you know, taboo for women to be doing moko. Yeah, it was unheard of. So how did you start? Initially, I asked uh, Gordon Toy, who's a, who's a relation of mine, um, if I could be his apprentice, and, and he said no. And then I met a friend who told me to go and study down in Gisborne at Toy Hokura School of Māori, Māori Visual Arts under Derek Lardelli. And um, so when I went there, I think it was in 2010, you kind of have to go through a process first. You're not allowed to just say, hey, I want to do moko, I'm here to do moko. You have to prove yourself. Um, so all of my artworks throughout the first two years were, you know, related to moko. Just to kind of prove a point, you know, that's why I'm here. So after your course in Gisborne, what were your next steps? Uh, there, there's a saying, you know, in the, in the moko world is, it's, it's to moko the world. Uh, my desire is to come home and and moko the kainga, you know, moko the village. Um, so it's a big thing for me um, to go out and see my work on everyone from home. Um, but also, you know, just to show other young ones and other aspiring artists, you know, that it can be done. You don't just have to go out and buy a machine of trade me and start. You can do it the right way. You can be qualified, you can do it under someone. And yeah, go home and you are you. So as a female, what sort of shortcomings have you experienced, if any? Nothing, nothing major, but you know, there's always going to be people that say, oh, it's, you know, females shouldn't do it. 
historically females didn't do it, you know, so there's always going to be people telling you you've kind of, you're kind of breaching tikanga. Do you know of a reason why women didn't do it historically? <sighs> Absolutely no idea. Does Absolutely. anybody? I'd, pro I'd say, probably say there is some people, um, but I wouldn't say it's fact. So what do you think that females bring to tamoko that male artists don't? Uh, I, gu I guess the, the understanding of the, the contour of the female body, you know, like um, my, most of my clients are female. Um, you know, it, it, it can just take one line to make a really feminine piece look really butch, you know, <laughs> and that can throw a whole piece out, you know, if you've got a small lady and you, you, you do a really big piece, it's just going to ruin the whole look of the moko. So I think that's one thing, you know, women can bring is the understanding of the flow uh, of the female body. So what significance does practicing tamoko up in the far north have for you? Um, you know, I, I was I was raised up here all my life and um, it's a big thing for me to give a moko to someone who did a lot for me, you know. Um, so giving back is the main thing for me. And where about do you get your influences from? I have a love for the water, you know, for the moana, and I have a love for waka. Recently I did a voyage um, through the Pacific, and I found when I came home from that, I had, you know, a different style, you know, because I was so influenced by, you know, other tato from the other islands, that I realised, you know, we're, we're really kind of different in styles, but as a, as a people, we're brothers and sisters, you know, of the Pacific. Um, so I kind of adopted some of their style, and it wasn't just like kind of stealing, you know, I had to learn, you know, the meanings behind it, and, um, yeah, kind of just work it into my, my mahi. Right. Yeah. How significant is being a mother to your art form? Yeah, I think it's just everything I do, like everyday life is for him, you know. So if I'm in through working through a big piece and, you know, he needs my attention, I'm just going to have to put a pause on that, <laughs> on that piece. Um, but it's made me understand and realise that family really does come first. Um, moko will always be there. Um, and I'm just glad that I get to indulge in both. You know, I have a great husband, um, so while I'm working, you know, he, he takes care of baby, he does the cooking, he does the cleaning. So I'm pretty, pretty lucky and pretty blessed. Where do you see the future of Tamoko for female artists? Uh, it's a very bright future at the moment. Um, we're, you're probably looking at about 20 to 30 artists, female artists in the country at the moment. Um, 10 years ago, there was probably about four. Wow. Um, so it's it's doing really well. And, you know, there's more coming along and um, it's just good to encourage females to go for it, you know, like, don't worry about the stigma, we're kind of past that. You know, we're walking into a contemporary world where things are kind of okay and you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So yeah, I just encourage, encourage any, you know, young, young or old, <laughs> female aspiring artist, um, just to go for it. Yeah, there's nothing holding you back. In part two of episode one, we'll be trekking down to Waitomo to catch up with contemporary Māori artist Daniel Ormsby to get his thoughts on moko and kiratuhi.